chair of burials and the old burials around in New York. I'm not sure why, but uh, apparently were chairs, but most people uh, didn't believe in it. They felt that they were bad for your posture and they would sit on the ground. And it's interesting that it, there's a, a, a being that's in the moon, the full moon, and you can see his outline. And uh, this, the, the, it's a rabbit man, half man, half rabbit. And he has long ears, big huge ears that flow to the back. And you see it on the full moon. You see the dark seas and it creates this shape of this teacher who was good luck, of course. And he's sitting uh, in the Indian fashion, which people call it the Taylor fashion. And uh, I'm sitting on the chair today. It's just, I feel comfortable sitting on the chair. And my voice will project better. Um, but even he is sitting in, in Indian fashion. And that's why when you look up, he doesn't seem to have any legs, because they're all tucked under. So next full moon, look up at, at the moon. And he's facing to the left of the moon, and his ears are falling to the right at the top. Mm -hmm. And then you see his, um, he's got an arm that's uh, dangling off of his knee. That's, and you'll see that. And there's pictures. I usually show pictures of him. But uh, the man in the moon, you know, the rabbit, Wabus, we call him. So um, last week I talked about the uh, phenomenon of the land keepers <clears throat> and how they're similar to bodhisattvas or different. It turns out that there are many, many similarities. And the reason I'm so compelled to speak here at this place is because right outside the window in the other room is a, a view of the spot where a twin oak used to stand. And the twin oak is uh, what, ha what results when a great orator is buried at a crossroads. They put an acorn in his mouth, and the, the uh, die cut leaves go out different channels in the skull, and then you end up with a twin oak instead of a single oak. So whenever you see a twin oak, we generally consider that to be a burial of an orator. And the, there's different roads and trails that met over there. And you have Broadway was the trail, and you have the path to the waiting place, which is Bowery. That was the trail. And then you have the Sapohannikin Trail cutting across. And again, I mentioned, this is a recap for whatever it was here <coughs> last week, but <coughs> the Sapohannikin Trail, which means the place of growing tobacco, starts over in Gansport Street, goes up Greenwich Avenue south to Washington Square Park, where it crosses Mineta Creek, and it's underneath the ground now. And then up to Astor, past here, which is called the Quinta Coyin, was the great powwow grounds, renowned, renowned among Native Americans. And then up through uh, where St. Mark's Chapel is that Stuyvesant built on Stuyvesant Place. So that was the trail. So all these trails converge where we are now. And this is where orators would speak. And Cooper Square and Astor Place, all of this is, is put here to commemorate it in a secret code kind of way, which is what New York is all about. There's all kinds of codes everywhere. It's a whole other lecture. Um, but we do have a traffic circle. And uh, last week, the mud truck was sitting right there where the, the great orator was there. Okay. So the orator was there because of the crossroads, and the twin oaks were there because of the orator. And then other orators would emulate this tradition by speaking under the great twin oak. And so now, it's an honor to be here to carry on this tradition, because then what kind of speakers were they? What were they talking about? Well, they talked about all kinds of things. But generally, they were considered to be spiritual teachers, enlightened ones. And sometimes they would talk about politics or social matters and concerns. They talked about ethics. But part of the, the idea was that they were uh, enlightened people. And it could be women or men, too. And uh, so this is tradition here. And of course, Abe Lincoln gave one of his most moving speeches here in Cooper Square. And uh, people howled like wild Indians. And we don't know their names and the people who spoke at that tree, but we know their grandchildren because they went to Ohio and in the 1760s were very influential. And, and then it, I want to bring in the story um, about Eunice Bauman Nelson, whom I met when she was very old. 
and she had an epiphanal experience. Now, you know, when we talk about, there's different types of enlightenment. I want to talk about that today. Like different cultures have different meanings of enlightenment. It's very confusing. Some of them are totally opposite from each other. But Eunice Bauman Nelson was uh, the sister of Molly Spadilov, who was a very popular entertainer in the 20s. And she really helped develop the flapper and all that stuff. Comes out of Native American culture, believe it or not. Um, that's Molly Spotted Elk. And she was, you know, became silent film star, a Broadway star, and an anthropologist right here in New York. But she was Pedaska, one of our Algonquins, and she understood a lot of this. All the anthropologists were coming to her and saying, Well, tell us about your tribe. Tell us about your tribe. And she's getting all the attention. Eunice was really the smart one. And Eunice was younger, and she would like, um, sit and listen. And then one day she said, I want to go into anthropology. These guys are cool. I want to study them. <laughs> so she got a grant to go to NYU. And this is in, uh, I think that was in the 50s, 1950s. And she came to New York, obviously Penobscot, and uh, she studied anthropology. And one day in the autumn, she was walking towards Washington Square Park. Um, and I have it in the book what road it was, but it's off of, off of Greenwich Avenue. And um, I can't remember the street name. But <clears throat> there, she was walking across the crosswalk on an autumn day, and she was new to New York. I don't know how any of you experienced New York for the first time, you were just grew up here. It's different, but when you're from somewhere else, somewhere else like I was. And I'll tell you my story that I very rarely tell, how I came here. It's quite phenomenal. But most of us, when we first come to New York, there is this whole awakening that happens because you're looking at a whole new uh, kind of communal phenomenon. And New York City is an amazing place. Seven million people all kind of getting along and kind of doing their own thing. And there's a tremendous amount of racial tolerance here, too. And so she was new to New York City. She'd only been here less than a year, I think and studying anthropology, wanting to see how everything works. And she walked across the crosswalk, she got to the middle, and she looked at this giant elm tree that's on the corner there of Washington Square Park. It's in the northwest corner. And she had an epiphanal experience. And she was looking at this great, huge tree, which is still there. And I take people on there to see the tree in the tours. And she had an epiphanal experience, which was a kind of satori type of enlightenment, a sudden enlightenment. And she looked up at the tree, and she saw a model of the universe. And she saw the universe inherent in the tree itself. So she wasn't really looking at the tree. She was looking at the universe with a kind of an audiovisual aid provided by the Almighty. You see. And so she looked at the tree, and she saw the great trunk, which was the, the ground of being, the coming out of the void, in a sense, the, that phenomenal uh, foundation of all existence. And, you know, in India, it would be an elephant. And then they asked Joseph Campbell, well, what's that elephant sitting on? Another elephant. And then what's that elephant sitting on? Another elephant. Well, it's elephants all the way down. Do you remember that story? Well, here's the trunk of reality. And up comes this great force. And then comes these large branches, which are the species, and this, you know, the planet species. And then more branches coming out of that. And then the humans, and then she sees her Native Americans as a branch, and then she is this tiny little twig in this great tree, you see. And she saw it all as one single being. And that is a form of enlightenment, especially in the Algonquin tradition and in the Tibetan tradition. Enlightenment is associated with an, an extension of identity, uh, of a feeling of oneness with all sentient beings. And arguing, of course, what sentient beings are. But sentient beings mean beings that have senses, including sight, smell, hearing, and uh, touch. And touch is very universal. And that, if you include touch as a sense, which it is, that includes plants. We know plants have touch sensitivity. So she's looking at a tree, and she's seeing herself in the tree, and she's seeing herself as part of this vast, vast, teeming ocean of life. 
and she sees not only that it's one, but she sees how it's one. And then she changed her major. <laughs> I think she was standing in that crosswalk for hours, I don't know. And cars were just beeping, you know the whole story, right? She was like looking at the tree with her mouth up, but for a long time, we don't know how long. She had no idea how long she was standing there. The cars, I suppose, were driving around her. But I've often stood in that spot and looked at that tree, it's still there. And um, she went and changed her major, and she wanted to focus on how people could live together in communities and find new solutions to how people could work and live together and actually uh, cohabitate. So she went to a kind of a fairly revolutionary kind of cohabitation study, and she got a doctorate. She became Dr. Eunice Bellman Nelson. And she taught, I think, at the University of Maine. And now there's a whole room of her writings. And I actually went into that room and got permission to look at all her stuff, and some of it's pretty cool. She decided that Gandhi had the right idea about nonviolence and that and in terms of people living together harmoniously. And so she studied Gandhiism and again it made part of her whole academic route and also gave workshops and lectures on Gandhiism. Well what is so interesting about that is that Everything she did was within the ancient Penobscot tradition, and yet she did not know that. When I met her, unfortunately, she was starting to lose her memory. And I mean, you know, as can only happen at a certain age, and uh, she didn't remember a lot of details. But she had written previously and interviewed previously, and so we know she's on record about this then. Well, it's interesting that she didn't seem to know a lot about the Penobscot, and yet all the things that happened here were all part of the tradition. For example, one of the uh, descendants of the prophets who spoke here at the Twin Oaks was named Patton Hank, <coughs> and he was living in Ohio. Uh, his ancestors were from New York. They got kicked out. You know, uh, I think it was Belcher, Governor Belcher, an English governor, put a price on the head of every Lenape. Bring them on in, and we'll pay you. I mean, bring them in. Not dead or alive, but just the first option. And then it became inconvenient, so it was only scalps. By the way. So they left, a lot of them left. Went to Ohio. Pat and Hank was an enlightened being, according to accounts. When his father died, he felt, again, very close to his father, and his heart was wounded by this. And he went walking in the woods along an old trail, and he looked up at a giant tree, and he had an epiphanal experience of looking at the tree and suddenly seeing how all life was one. What does that sound like? It sounds like units, but she never knew the story. Mm -hmm. And so he looked up at this tree, and he, he had what people call you know, a satori type, a sudden enlightenment, seeing how all life is related, and his heart was healed and opened up. And he felt that love for all life. You know, and began a new phase in his career. Well, Eunice didn't realize that she, here in New York City, was walking along the trail. Mm -hmm. okay, it took me research years to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. She was walking along the trail that no longer existed because it would become a crosswalk. And you know the trail that goes into the, besides the arch down, you all know Washington Square Park. It's awesome, right? You take that trail that, you know, the park designers have placed there and it goes to the fountain. Well, that's an actual trail site, right dead on that. And so she was walking along that trail, just as her just you know relatives, ancestors would. And then she looked at the tree, and she had that satori type of enlightenment. It's interesting, but she didn't know. And then, of course, as I mentioned last week, that her attraction to Gandhi also ties in very closely with her specific direct relatives, because Eunice Bauman Nelson is directly related to Joseph Polis and Joseph Addian, who lived across the street where, from where I met her, but they lived in the 1830s in this wooden, uh, what do they call that, clabbered-sided house, and where I talked to her and interviewed her was in a modern building across the street, interestingly enough. But she was related to them. I mean, this is a little island. They live on Indian Island in the Penobscot River, and they're related. Henry David Thoreau was a young man, and he was Remember, he didn't pay his taxes, so his auntie paid his taxes to get him out of jail. But he was protesting. He was, you know, wanted to do something. He didn't know how to do it. But he was mad about the Mexican War. 
and uh, wanted to make his voice heard. He didn't know what to do. So people said, well, get out of here and just take a walk in the woods. You know, go to Maine. So he wanted to go to Maine, and his friends told him, well, you know, you, you're really a city kid, and you really better have a trail guide or you'll be eaten by a moose. So he got a trail guide, and it so happened the trail guide was Joseph Polis, who was a master of what's called the Way of the Heron, which is a nonviolent, and again, it comes out of the Enlightenment tradition, you know, that uh, the people had this ancient Way of the Heron, nonviolent. And Joseph Polis had negotiated between Canada and the United States, an illiterate man, technically, negotiated the border between Maine and uh, Quebec, which was a guy pretty nasty, and he made it all work out because he knew the way of the hair in this diplomatic, nonviolent way. So there said, imagine, here's this unknown hippie guy, right, who was trying to write poetry, and it's up to you if you think it was good at this point. And he's mad about the war, and they're sitting around the campfire in the middle of freaking nowhere. I mean, totally remote spot. I mean, it's in his book, The Main Woods, and just got him over something. So they're way out there. And the rabbi says, well, what would you do if, if one of your leaders just didn't listen to you and whatnot? Wouldn't do anything for the people, but serve himself. And Joseph Paul said, well, we, we wouldn't harm a hair in his head and we'd love them, but we would refuse to cooperate. We would just resist. And uh, so he asked more questions, and he told them a story about a liberty pole that the French had put up as goodwill with the people, and then the English took over. And we're going to cut down the Liberty Pole. It was symbolically devastating. And so the Native Americans, the Penobscots, chained themselves. They had parades, they had marches, they had songs and protests, and they carried little pockets. And, and they tied themselves to the base of the pole. What does that sound like? It's non, you know, civil disobedience, non-violent demonstration. And, um, and the way of parent also includes uh, non-violent conflict resolution. It's all part of the same thing. So he gave them this whole teaching. <laughs> he was lucky to learn this, you know. And so, he went back home or to Massachusetts, and he was asked to give a speech to a small crowd like this. So we gave this whole talk, and somebody eventually called it on civil disobedience. He didn't call it that. It was just a talk to a bunch of uh, elderly housewives, in fact. Well, it took years. It wasn't published during his life, except in the newsletter of the Women's Auxiliary. I mean, humble beginnings, right? And then it ended up in a, in a book of his collected writings in 1900, published by Oxford, and Mr. Salt, Professor Salt, sent me this book to a young student, Mohannes Gandhi. Mohannes Gandhi read it and said, this is what I'm looking for, and he applied it. So let's go back to where we are now, okay? Because that tree is still over there, and Eunice looks at the tree, and she ultimately decides to go and study Gandhi. Because Gandhi was teaching what her great, great, great uncle taught exactly the same, and adding Satyagraha and many important uh, Jainist teachings, and her, his grandma was Jainist. Okay, so what does that have to do with enlightenment? Well, that's, she had a satori, and what happened was that, you know how it is sometimes that time and space somehow bend, and the way opens, and a, and a situation is provided for you to have an enlightenment experience. And it may just be that one time, or it may be part of a long growth period. It may be a fluke that becomes permanent. But in the uh, in the way in the Algonquin way, there are generally several different stages of enlightenment, and they're not really linear. They happen to us in whatever order they happen, and you're lucky to have them. And I want to go over that today. But I just want to talk a little bit about different kinds of enlightenment experiences. You know, unfortunately, the enlightenment, right? The, revolu the industrial revolution brought about, you know, and the forefathers, Americans, you know, this idea, this deist uh, universe where God sets up the clock and leaves, and it's all very rational, which is nothing wrong with that, but it's incomplete. And that, interestingly, is called the enlightenment, even though it flies in the face of long-standing millennia of Buddhist and Hindu and Zen traditions of enlightenment. I think it's called enlightenment because the founding fathers were really educated in the like European, the thought of the European enlightenment, that period. Oh yes, and the German enlightenment too was phenomenal. 
Yeah, that's why I think it's coming up. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But I mean, <clears throat> the gadfly. But yeah, it it it's interesting because the German Enlightenment really comes out of the Pietists, who were very enlightened from the kind of Enlightenment we're talking about. The Pietists are fascinating movement. Actually, I was thinking more of the French Enlightenment. Okay. Because I think they were better. They, the Fathers were better read in the, the okay. thinkers of the French Enlightenment. You're right. Not really more of a direct hit. I'm particularly interested in, in the German yeah, phenomenon. Right. So, so let me go to just there. Talk about that. Just talk okay. about that. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. The French Enlightenment was actually the direct influence. Yeah. You know, Rousseau and you know, who Rousseau romanticized the Americans and idolized them as noble savages, and probably not totally wrong. I hope, but um, the German Pietists were very humble people and very much into subsuming the ego in order to enter into uh, a pure love uh, for all beings. It's just similar to uh, Buddhist enlightenment. And it's out of that comes the German enlightenment. And I'm not sure which is first, frankly. The German goes back pretty far, um, back 1600. Um, and it's scientific. It ends up going somewhere else than we're going. So that gets confusing, because it's a bit mechanistic. <coughs> But in terms of the enlightenment, you know, in Hinduism, there's uh, often you know talk about self-realization, tied in with enlightenment, and that is a little different. There is a distinction. Okay, and in Buddhism, it's only according to my studies in Buddhism, enlightenment is generally thought of as uh, becoming one with all life, and you extending your identity so that you, your concerns, everyone's concerns are yours. And <clears throat> that is short of a Buddha, which is the knowledge of how everything is one. So those are different kinds. And then Zen, there's the sudden, associated with, with Satori as the sudden enlightenment, although that's not that. Okay. But in the Algonquin sense, it's most similar to Tibetan Buddhism in that it's clearly the teaching is that you, know, you might have a sudden enlightenment like this Papelhan cat, and as Eunice Bellman Nelson had, but ultimately it goes in stages and there's different levels of unfoldment and it's not attained. People don't talk about attaining enlightenment in the Native American because that seems too, how you say, um, presumptuous and too perhaps assertive because it's more of a passive culture in many ways. So we don't talk about attaining enlightenment, but it's something that unfolds like a flower, like a tree, like a plant. And you think about a young boy, and they brag about how he's bigger than his friend or his brother. I'm taller, and he'll brag, he'll be real proud that he's tall. Well, he didn't do anything to get tall, did he? It just happened. The kids will brag, oh, I'm bigger than him, you know? My brother's big, and my dad's bigger than your dad. <clears throat> like, so what, you know? What did you do to earn that? Well. It's kind of like that, in a sense, in the Algonquin teachings about enlightenment. It's all natural. It's natural for everyone to unfold towards a, a more uh, total engagement with the entire world. And I want to talk about those stages. So we don't brag about them, because everybody has some of it, and it just unfolds naturally. It's just like being somebody who may be a little taller, a little shorter, but um, it's inherent. Unfoldment. And I was looking at uh, a couple things. I talked a little bit about the paramitas last week. And it was interesting that in Tibetan Buddhism there's an idea that that if you're claiming enlightenment but you don't have haven't mastered the, the purifications of the heart of the paramitas, then you're just, you know, how it air. There is a sense of that in Algonquin as well, and that not what we call paramedias, but the idea of virtue, of ethical virtue. Um, our orators outside would have been talking about these things too. And I noticed that it was interesting uh, reading about the, the one, there's generosity, ethical conduct, renunciation, wisdom, energy, <coughs> patience, truthfulness, determination, loving kindness, and equanimity. I was reading about equanimity, and the Tibetan uh, philosophy takes this rather far in that discouraging so much from focusing your love on one person 
and as opposed to another and favoring one person instead of favoring another. Equanimity, I think, elsewhere in the world is is more maintaining an even strain and not being polarized, mm -hmm. not reacting to bad things and not, you know, uh, aversions and attractions, for example. Uh, yes, trying to minimize those, but in Tibetan, some philosophers have gone to the point of saying you should have no aversions and no attractions and everybody treating everybody the same. I think in the native view, that's probably the stoic side probably can pull that off. It's not maybe as important to go to the extreme. But <clears throat> we want to maintain a balance. So the, the lectures, the talkers about enlightenment would see not that these are, are prerequisites that somebody has to approve you. Nobody has to approve, you, approve your enlightenment. It can happen at the age of seven sometimes. We start out as children somewhat enlightened in the, in the Buddhist and the Algonquin sense. We have a sense of oneness. We have a sense of wanting to share. We're divine beings when we're born. And then at some point, we all lose that. Every one of us loses it to some extent. And then we go to sleep. It's like we're walking in the woods and we go to sleep. And then we wake up and we try to remember where we are. And we have to reconstruct this vision we had. And so there's a lot of uh, talk of that childhood state. And there's a phrase in Algonquin called Chi Chen Kiwi, which means great spirit, watch over me. And then Chi is great. Chan is actually the self. Chan is your true self. Chi Chen, great self. Kiwi, look over me, watch over me, protect me. And in this way, and I think it's very valuable right now because there's a lot of turmoil and fear in the world, and it's a good technique to get you through a bad day, so that you just you give it up. Okay, you go back all the way to the enlightenment you had when you were four, maybe it's three, but that sense of Shichan Kiwi, which is, okay, I'm going to put it all over and surrender it all. Of course, we don't like, in Algonquin, the Native American culture, we don't like the word surrender, because that brings up some bad memory. <laughs> you know? But let's think of it some other way. I mean, when you when you say Shichan Kiwi, you may you're, you're actually giving over trust to a higher being. You're saying, you know, take this. And uh, you I will put all that responsibility on you. And I'll just be here and I'll just do my best. And you know, that is often the absolute best state of consciousness to really do a good job, especially in the arts, in terms of the quality-oriented work that some do. That Shi Chen Bui state, that childlike trusting state is a very good practical state to be able to attain. So if you say to the creator, Chi Chan Kiwi, something happens and you just suddenly feel happy and loving, which is like that enlightenment state. And so at a certain point in your life, we have to reconstruct the enlightenment you had when you were a child. And we talk about that. And then you go on. We say that we love our Mother Earth. And in the Tibetan writings, I also see how the Bodhisattvas practice under directs under difficult circumstances, some of the Bodhisattva teachings are, well, when you're being attacked, say, you know, the invasion of the Chinese is rough, you know, and what do they do? Well, they talk about seeing these attackers as reincarnations of your mother, not your mother and stuff, but that you want to be angry, but you shouldn't be angry because it doesn't really help you, but that you visualize that these beings who are attacking you were your mother in a previous life and took care of you and nurtured you and kept you alive in a way that no one else could. So you owe them. And now through negative evolution, through unfortunate evolutions in history, this person has come back and being forced to attack you for reasons that may be beyond their control. So even though they're attacking you, of course, you defend yourself at the same time you close, you don't close your heart. And remember the, uh, the saying, uh, do what you must, but close your heart to no one. Because if you close your heart, then you're cutting off the flow of spirit, and that has to do with the essence of bodhicitta, or in Buddhism, or enlightenment. And so that really is also part of the Algonquin teachings, too. Now, the stages. Okay, so I was saying these virtues or parameters are things, they're signs. That's all they are. They're signs that you're on the path. Because if you if your heart was open on the level of a, 
of one of the enlightened ones, and the word is neolin in, in Algonquin. Neolin is an ancient word meaning and you know, enlightened, and uh, neolineo would be he is or she is enlightened. So there's all these um, virtues people talk about. They don't stop you from, from the enlightenment experience if you don't have them, but they can stop you in that if you are filled with the opposite of virtue, fear and it's called lu wei wu di, uh, bad things in my heart, lu wei wu di. And if you're filled in your heart with these bad things, they will prevent you from being relaxed enough and loving enough so that you won't be able to maintain enlightenment. So they do go together. But you can't judge someone else and say, well, you can't have enlightenment because I don't think you can be very virtuous. But those 10 things, the, the opposites of the karmitas, in other words, the lu wei wu di, the bad things in your heart, can get in your way and prevent you from maintaining those moments of enlightenment. So we say, in Algonquin teaching, we say that it starts with confusion. Confusion is the seed of the darkness. And if you feel confusion in your heart, it's not going to kill you, right? Not yet. But if you just ignore it and let it keep growing, then mm -hmm. that's when you get ultimately mm -hmm. into trouble. So the confusion could be coming from the outside. Somebody might be trying to confuse you, or you're misunderstanding and you're confused. I mean, it's not hard to be confused these days, right? So you just got to work with that and ask for help. We ask eagles for sending messages who help inform us because the information could help heal the confusion. You have to address the confusion. Anytime a skill builder, the minute they see confusion, they stop everything. If they're in a ceremony or sweat and everything gets confused, they stop. Even starting over, even if they've been in a ceremony two hours and somebody starts confusing everything, they'll stop, let's start over. You say, no, really? But the Dinley Norton used to do that, I heard. Dinley? Very rapid. Dinley Norton. He's no longer alive, but and he lived upstate New York, so I thought you might have heard of him. Yeah, apparently, yeah. I, I, I saw him a few times in California over the years, but apparently he would just like, he would, I've heard this about him, he would just stop everything. Okay, we'll, we'll do it over again. Yeah. Like, okay. that, that's, see, that's a new yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the confusion has to be stopped. And sometimes. <laughs> I never you, heard an explanation, but I just that's what was going on. All oh, right, because the confusion. <laughs> Because the confusion can lead to fear. Okay, this is what I was saying. Confusion leads to fear, and the fear can really make you tense and shut you down so you're not relaxed anymore. And once you're not relaxed, you're not going to get all this flow of energy and love and consciousness. And the fear leads to anger, and the anger leads to violence. So, part of the way of the heron is in order to prevent violence, you stop confusion in the butt right away. And they do that, and this is the way the Algonquins, you know, have a kind of activist history. But um, most of it is nonviolent, and most of it is going right out immediately and saying, you know, please explain. We don't understand. And often there's misunderstanding. Sometimes it's somebody says something, and I have some funny stories about people saying one thing. My, I was in the explanation, or I guess in examples. My mother came into my bedroom when I was five. And she said, would you like to have a horrible day? <laughs> oh. I was horrified. Mother, you're my mother, and you wishing me a horrible day. I don't think so. Why did you say that? I said, crying, Mom, why do you want me to have a horrible day? She said, I didn't say you want to have a horrible day. I said, you, would you like a hard-boiled egg? <laughs> well, I do like hard-boiled egg. So I said, oh, yeah, OK. But sometimes misunderstandings create confusion. They create fear, which I felt at that moment, anger. Nicolina violence. Okay, that's a silly example, but it's real. And the same thing happened with chiefs and leaders who get together and misunderstand each other and they say the wrong thing and fights break out. So out of that comes Lu Wei Wu Di, the bad things in your heart. And there's a tobacco ceremony where you put, you know, you can remove, surgically remove this Lu Wei Wu Di using tobacco to draw out the energy and then you discard it. So I want to talk about the uh, the seven stages of awakening. And <clears throat> the first one, when uh, McMath would say, one top ten. This is a deep feeling of peace. And 
I was referring last week indirectly to one of the four gifts that the Anishinaabe talk about, and that is peace in your heart, that we're born with peace in our heart. We're born enlightened, and part of that is that foundation, is having that peace. If you could have studied enlightenment for years, and on a particular day, if you have, if you totally lose the peace in your heart, you're not going to feel <clears throat> or experience the gifts of enlightenment. But you can always recover it. And it's said that in Tibetan Buddhism, that there are bodhisattvas, that something will happen and they'll get lost and they'll lose that enlightenment for a while. But it's said, I asked this question of uh, some of our upstate ones. And they said, oh yeah, well, they'll find it again. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like in football, you know, it's forward motion, right? It really is a good parallel. Um, so Bodhi, bodhisattvas may lose that temporarily, but they'll find it again because it's inside of them. And the same thing, we lose the peace in our heart, we can't experience the enlightened state of with that kind of fear or anger or whatever it is. So, and as I was quoting, last week was an elder that said, he's seen lots of babies, he's never seen a baby, with armor on. So he takes that as a sign. So we're talking about this one topic, um, this sometimes we see it in others, and another person can convey to us a sense of peace and well-being. And if we've already experienced certain experiences of enlightenment, then it's funny because in that moment, it's darshan, I guess you could call it, but in our way too, Algonquin's there's different tribes where they don't, or nations and cultures where they don't look at people directly because it can be very intense. And I would say we have some of that. At the same time, there are moments when you really get to know the teacher and there's a, an eye contact that can convey a sense of peace through the eyes. And then that, it's interesting how that can trigger previous experiences of enlightenment and even even new levels of enlightenment of what the, the teacher has. It's something that you can't learn from a book, right? We all know that. Okay, and here I have, this is from a book that I wrote, but you know, it's talking about some of the stages, but it doesn't give you the enlightenment. But sometimes looking at somebody and through the eyes conveying that sense of peace can trigger a stage of enlightenment that the person has already had or is ready to have. The second is Ankhidasi Waka. Ankidasi Waka means thinking big thoughts. And I again mentioned that last week, in that when Thurman talks about the extending your sense of identity to include not just your lover or your wife or husband, but to everyone. And that's part of the enlightenment experience. And so we say that, yeah, you know, when you see yourself in the same canoe as someone else, then you have a sense of love and bonding with them. But then if you extend in that canoe, their whole family, your whole family, your whole village, all your particular nation, and then maybe the whole country and then the world, then you see everybody in the same boat, which is true, isn't it? And then you have a feeling, that feeling of oneness and understanding that you are thinking big thoughts, but you do it one step at a time. And that, again, ties in directly with the Bodhisattva idea of, okay, so a Bodhisattva loves everyone with shared uh, you know, shared interest, right? Shared survival interest with everyone. How do you get there? Well, and the Algonquin has an answer to that, is that first you extend that oneness to one person and then to a group and a village and then the whole world. And that is called Onkigasi Wakan. And that word means wisdom. Okay? So in our tradition, the word wisdom means that kind of enlightenment. And it's, it's in stages. It's thinking bigger and bigger thoughts so that you're inclusive, more and more inclusive, and more. It's not necessarily, see, to understand how all things are one, that's the very advanced stage. And then in Buddhism, again, that's associated more with the Buddha. So this is an important uh, stage. It's really a way of seeing. So when you're Anki Dasi walking, it's all about perception. You're looking at life as it is and you're not trying to twist it around and you're not trying to be a Pollyanna and looking at everything through rose-colored glasses because that's the opposite of wisdom, isn't it? Okay, you're also not looking through a glass darkly. You know? and you're not a pessimist either because that drags everybody down and reduces the possibility 
of increasing the uh, consciousness. So it's right on, it's the balance. You know, there's, there's a phrase, walking straight behind the plow. It's like getting everything. And it, it, it's not the same thing as the equilibrium or equanimity. It is just uh, a dynamic balance. And you can't describe it when you see somebody doing it. And you learn it from them. Now, the next stage is the third stage, which is, uh, again, this ties in with the idea of seeing all beings as your mother. And again, when I was talking about landkeepers, the landkeepers are ones when they reach a stage of enlightenment in life, they make a covenant and they kind of throw themselves upon the earth and say, I dedicate my spirit to Mother Earth. And it's easy because it's their mother. They literally see it as their mother, more than their physical mother. And they love that mother because it gives them everything. They transfer motherness onto Earth. And so they serve it completely. And so it makes perfect sense for them that after they die, they're going to serve uh, to protect the, what we call nature. They don't have that word, but to serve their mother. So, Kamalamun Jai is a word based on uh, Mi'kmaq. Uh, Kamalamun is my heart and my breath. Because they know that when your heart stops, your breath stops. And there is a connection between the heart and the breath in that when you breathe in, you're bringing in oxygen that becomes red blood cells that goes into the heart and out. I'm not a doctor, you know, just saying. There's a connection there. Um, they see breath and life and spirit as connected. And so they talk about Manitou, which is the great spirit, Pichi Manitou. I'm sure you've heard of that. And this is a word you find in some form in all the different Alpacan languages. And this is great spirit or great mystery. And we say, great spirit whose voice is heard in the wind, in the trees. Reveal yourself to us, different phrases. Well, it, so it does seem to be a connection between the wind and invoking the presence of the Great Spirit. It was never seen in the form. But also, this seems to show up in a lot of ancient languages, an equivalence between the word for wind and for spirit. I mean, rupa. I mean, you find it, as, how do you say in Italian, as there, expire. And, and spirit, spirit just, it's all connected, it's very directly connected. Well, like in, in prana. Prana, exactly. It's breath, yeah. and it's spirit. You find that all over the world, and it's the same thing in Algonquin. We say, Kam, Kamalun, my heart and my breath. And Kamalun Jai is an, eli an elision of Mun Jai, Skudaman Jai, it means to wake up, to get up, and Kamalun. So it's like opening, awakening of the heart. So in this, this is literally the first stage. This is we're at the third stage of the seven, but it's literally uh, associated with enlightenment. And again, the word Nielin is enlightenment, and it's an awakening of an unconditional love. But did you have a question? Yeah, question. When you said um, great, great spirit or great mystery, yeah, is that um, is that idea, uh, philosophy, a singular great spirit or great mystery, and also is that um, great mystery, something that is knowable, or always sort of knowable through its mystery. No, it, well, it's a good question. Um, again, when you're talking about these things, there is a certain autonomy that a teacher has that you know they can express it as they understand it. And I would say right now to you that there is only one great mystery, but there are many manitous. Does that confuse you? Manitou meaning. Well, there's different uh, definitions of Manitou. One is that it is great mystery. Another definition of Manitou is that it just means any kind of spirit. They could even be a bad one, frankly. But there are Manitous on the 12 levels of the clouds in the sky, which are like boomies. Mm -hmm. There's a Manitou on each of those, it's a major one. And they're celestial beings. And there's Manitous for every mountain and lake and tree and you know, Manitous. And these are a lot like the celestial bodhisattvas, and the generally those but those manitus I'm talking about are very benevolent, mm. very helpful. Um, but there's other. I mean, manitou is used for all kinds of spirit. But when it's like if you're writing it, use a capital M. Oh, it's like Titi Manitou, Great Spirit. Mm. And there's one, and it is not explainable. It's not understandable by anybody. Mm. And if you think you understand it, then get in the back of the line, because you start over, you see, because you're creating confusion. <laughs> to tie it all together. 
but sign language always comes to my rescue because the sign language is so ancient that it predates all the words. We can be sure of that because the same sign is used uniformly all across North America, South America, Central America. They all use the same basic signs. And obviously, there's no one word in Algonquin, it's one of the oldest languages in the world, language groups in the world, that predates that. So there's a sign like this, spirally, spiraling up to the left, which is the direction into the unknown, going upwards into the higher levels of the boonies or the cloud levels, as you say. Okay, and that's the mystery. And this is great, great, expanding. So this is the expanding mystery that's ascending into higher levels into infinity. Yeah, that's it. We can solve it and it's done. <laughs> and that is also translated as I've seen um, Amazing Grace, the song, which is a Cherokee, I mean, a Cherokee is saying Amazing Grace in Cherokee. And I saw it signed the other day, and Grace was also makes sense. Grace is the mystery we don't understand. So, yeah, no, if you understand the great mystery, get in the back of the line because you missed it up. Okay, the, the wise ones see, know that there's more than they can understand, even if they're thinking these thoughts. They know it's a whole lot bigger. And there's the incredible string band song, as you remember. <laughs> Whatever it is you think, it's more than that, right? <laughs> oh, happy man. Okay. So you're happy to know that there's more you can't know. And this is a big difference, and there's a funny thing. This comes up as a college professor of many years. This is a big dividing line, is that there tends to be the sense in academia and in publishing that, yeah, we want everything. We want the absolute encyclopedia of it, whatever it is. We want the encyclopedia yeah, now. Okay. We want everything, all comprehensive, all tied together in one uniform package that's just always, and, and now in medicine, by the way, they're going to this, this new kind of medicine. They want, they're working on a universal um, charting now. This is this past two months or so where all the hospitals in the world will all be using exactly the same program for charting and that you can send, like, no more, oh no, I never had a problem with this, because then, you know, you go into Singapore and you go to a doctor and say, oh, I never had trouble with that, and boom, yes, you did, you were in Cleveland in 1991 and you committed a, you know, to this, you said that you had diabetic symptoms. See, this, this is the new world, okay. Well, so Surveillance. Okay, but in the European model, there seems to be this very strong desire to be able to put a lid on everything and say, this is the answer, and it includes everything. And we say, there's a great grandfather philosophy of life that explains everything. Right? And there's a great grandmother philosophy of life that contradicts it word for word. <laughs> right? So it's never really going to be all. It's, as Joseph Campbell would say, it's not going to lie flat. It doesn't lie flat. I like that. One well, of my favorite Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. And that's a form of, that. it is a form of enlightenment to understand that, and it leads to that mental state that is open to new things. To realize that whatever you think is more than that, and that all the knowledge you accumulate is never going to catch up with the expansion of the universe and what great spirit is really up to. And so when the scholars say that the difference between a bodhisattva and a Buddha is bodhisattvas, you know, they made the vow to rescue all sentient beings from darkness, from samsara, and that the Buddha and they see the oneness of life, but the Buddha understands and has knowledge of exactly how everything's connected, which makes sense, and is a teacher of the gods, which makes sense. But then, what does that really mean? Well, it's an expanding universe. So these are principles. You know, and it's also a state of mind. There's a state of mind where all knowledge is accessible, according to you know Buddhist thinking about the Buddhist state of consciousness, and and you can experience some of that at times, like and it's well, it's a psychic psychic awareness state where you just somebody to ask something and you know, and you don't know how you know, but the universe wants you to know, so you do, and that's part of being the uh, gift fulfilling jewel, isn't it? So I'm going to get there. We're going there. Um, but anyway, the Kamalam, the awakening of the heart, has to do with that Shichan Kwiwi state of being like a baby and being totally open and trusting. 
And so, yeah, information may come in, and you may see the oneness, and even see how it all is working around you. But in the Algonquin sense, it would be presumptuous to, to say, oh, yeah, we have the answers, because the Algonquin is always saying, no, there's more that we can't ever know. And that's the great mystery. Yeah, it's expanding to the upwards to the infinity. So it's a beautiful thing. And also that gentleness and that detachment, the equanimity part is, as I was quoting, was an extreme view, but it does lead to detachment. Now, one of the things that I first noticed that got me really interested in Tibetan Buddhism is the idea of balance between detachment and compassion. And it really resonated with my Algonquin soul. The idea being that these two things actually go together. It's that you have, in order to be truly compassionate in, in the expansive, universal sense of you know, the Bodhisattva, you have to be detached. Otherwise, it'll kill you. Mm-hmm. And especially in the middle of a war or some disaster. I mean, how can you stand it? You have to be able to have that equanimity where you know, you're detached from, from all of these things. And, and not, not disconnected either, but uh, unattached. Okay? And this, again, this whole side of Algonquin spirituality, which is stoic, the idea of being the noble warrior, where you are uh, impervious to pain almost, to be the warrior, to defend your people. The warrior of Madana is a defender, not an attacker. And but also must be somewhat, uh, first of all, non-reactive and calm in order to help others. You were going to say something. Oh, I just thought that important. Um, one of the Zen texts that have been translated into English used the term non-attachment. Right. It's not particularly an important comment. No, it is important because I totally agree with it. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to think of the, the non-attachment is the word I was looking for. Vairag. Vairag in Sanskrit. Okay. That means non-attachment. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean you're detached or disconnected. Right, it means right. you're non-attached. That's the word I'm looking for. Yes. Vairag. And um, thank you. So then, let's go on. Uh, there's a word, powwow, by the way. And you know, you think of powwow as. Yeah, what language is that? Southampton. Uh, totally it's part of our thing. seven stages of enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Yes, powwow. I think it's used. So you go and you know you see dancers and people are bending. And it's called a powwow, but that's not, you know, that's how they got there. I know. But <laughs> this site outside our door here was the Kinta Koyin means where the people are dancing. And the uh, cantico comes into English from the same word. And there are people in this giant gathering spot, which probably included right where we are now, because it was large, and uh, surrounded that whole crossroads area. And the people would dance, but they would come to hear the oratory from the powwows. And the powwow is uh, originally named after one fellow whose name means he dreams. So powwow means he dreams, and that's what it means. There is a pun play on words which pow with waterfall. So it's like his wisdom is like a waterfall. Mm-hmm. You know, you meditate on the waterfall. There's sacred spots. There were waterfalls in Manhattan, and then uh, Astor, this place was named after John Astor, he was involved with Clinton in flattening Manhattan and erasing all the waterfalls that were here. Mm-hmm. And here we are, just a fact. Um, but this man, Powell, okay, he dreams. He means his dreams. In his dreams, he would see beyond what even one would see in the state of Kamala and Dai, or the open heart. He would, in his dreams, would see more than other people in vivid dreams. He would see the other worlds. He would see different dimensions and spirit beings in his dreams, and he would speak of, of these dreams. So this is another level, and um, you can call it sort of like an out-of-body experience. And in the Delaware, even today, some talk about sitting in your chair and going somewhere. It's mm-hmm. a wonderful impression. You know what that's like, you know, and then you're tired, and you sit down, and you just, shh, you zoom out to some other, where you're seeing all these dream-like pictures, and then you're back. Or you deliberately do it, you sit, and you use different kinds of like, um, astral, right? it's a, it could be astral or another level. Mm-hmm. It could be mental, etheric, or soul travel, as it's called. And you sit and you deliberately, there are certain techniques, shaman techniques, where you go on a journey through the spirit world to find the medicine for somebody or for yourself. That's where the sh- word shaman is, to 
it means to heal, to help heal, generally using plants, but animal powers, and definitely mm-hmm. the journey is part of it. And so the Delaware do this, and all the Algonquins. So it's part of the powwow experience, not the dancing part. The dancing comes because people were gathering to hear the orator under the, the twin oak tree, and then they would do ritual dancing together because a nidohane or dancing is part of prayer. Prayer is a very big part of Algonquin culture. It's not always praying to God, it could be praying to an animal, animal spirit, a manitou, etc. But dancing is a very powerful form of prayer. And so while you're dancing, you're praying. And Tibetans do this in Tibet. Oh, we used to. You know, whenever there was um, a big ceremony or whenever there was a problem and they were asking, praying to the poor bodhisattvas for help, they would put on ritual costumes, making them into some of these beings and solar beings, and they would dance together in the square. It's still an exile. Where? In Bhutan or? In the U.S. Oh, really? Yeah. I haven't. Well, okay, I guess I've seen it. Okay. But I think in Tibet they really put on the dog. <laughs> but where did where have you seen like a really grand well, prayer dancing? Well, uh, out in the redwood hills outside of Santa Cruz. Uh, okay, I've never been. In oh, I've been in yeah, the Alps. Okay, okay, okay. In California. California. Yeah, no, yeah, there, there are. I miss that. There are there were exiled lamas who trained students in ritual dance and the costumes, and the best thing is if you could find a, if there's a maybe a highly realized lama who's also a dancer like there's an emanation of gesso and gesso is a warrior on horseback, yeah, and he's sometimes in the U.S. and um, he was one of the ones who left in the '59 around that time he fled over the U.S. and he. He does certain dances connected with that many days that I went to. One's called a black hat dance, and it's you st- stomp out ego. Well, chud, right? Yeah, the, chud. Well, the chud is something else. Okay, similar. Oh, anyway. the, the chud is something else. But, yeah. but so these these dances are that that I mean the Tibetan culture is much better preserved. They do. Their culture was disrupted, but they really, I think, preserved a lot in exile. Both in India and in the US, I don't know about communities in Europe. Mm-hmm. Okay, because I've seen it in films in, in Tibet where they really pray and dance, and that's good to know. The Desjardins film? There's a lot of films. The Desjardins film was done in early 1960s in India. Uh-huh. And he, he actually was given permission to film things in his hate theater. Yeah. There's a couple of films, but I'm glad to hear that's going on in the U.S. Yeah. Because upstate New York, I haven't seen much of the prayer dancing in Tibetan culture. Yeah, I mean, that I don't know about. I know there's some upstate New York. Yeah. Could be here, yeah. So, so the powwow started out as a prayerful dance that preceded or included the orator's speech, and he was a powwow because he was speaking from what he saw in his dreams, and dreams are very powerful. There's a story, uh, I never remember this man's name at the right time, but oh, his name Conrad Weiser. I remember. Conrad Weiser was a German who came to America in the very early days, in the early colonial days. And he was walking with his Native American friend, and he understood the religion and the aspect of how important dreams were. And uh, so he said, uh, he was walking along, and they come to this beautiful island. And uh, the Indian said, I dreamt that you gave me your rifle. And he looks at him like, you know, and he knows, you know what this means. I dreamt last night that you gave me your rifle. Of course, it's customary. If somebody dreams something, you want it to manifest because part of native spirituality, Algonquin spirituality, is to make creation manifest. That what's coming down from spirit, you want to manifest it in physical form, whenever possible, as long as it's good. That's the process of life, and that's what everything, all the drumming, the sun up, and all those things, it's all about helping creation to continue, which is our ultimate goal at most times. So he looks at him, gives him those sheepy, you know, eyes. Oh, I dreamt that you gave me a rifle. And of course, Conrad Weiser, 
knew the costume, and he said, here, take my rifle. And by the way, last night I dreamt that you gave me this island. And Ian said, okay, you can have the island, but I'm not dreaming with you again. <laughs> anyway, it's a true story. And that's how important dreams are. So when the Palo says, I dreamt this, everybody just stops and listens, because, okay, the reason he's called powwow is a lot of people, everybody dreams, right? But why is this guy different? Well, the difference is that some people's dreams tend to have resonance with the, uh, how you say it, with the Mahamutra, that have resonance with the whole universe. And so, and it comes out of that state of consciousness, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So some people, their dreams are reliable, and every time they dream something, well, I dream we have to store up seven years of grain, you know, and Joseph, right? Okay, and then it works. So now he's the dream master, right? And that's the way it is. Some people, their dreams never come true. They're always confused and they're wrong. But some people in Indian culture have that gift. And in Algonquin culture, that person immediately rises to the top. Because right? they need that. And then Iroquois the same way, held in Honoshone culture. So powwow was the guy whose dreams tended to prove out. Can you talk for a second about this idea of um, mm -hmm. that the process of life is to make creation manifest? Yes. In the, in the sense of um, uh, why, and uh, if that doesn't happen, you know, is there a negative thing that it must happen because if it does, if we weren't to do that, I don't know. I'm just very creation would end. That we are, we are an important part. I mean, there, there is a teaching that came out inside me today that I don't know if one but about the seven fires prophecies, and I got a deeper understanding today about this while standing in Manhattan, looking at all the people, and just like Eunice, you know. But um, yeah, if it's thought that if, well, no, nobody drummed up the sun. We don't know what happened because. The tradition is somebody somewhere will drum up the sun every morning. And the anthropologists came out early on, and they talked to these people drumming up the sun. And so why are you drumming, why are you doing that? Well, you know, I'm going to drum up the sun, so we've got to do it. And said, well, how do you know it's really that that's bringing the sun up in the east? Well, because that's what we're told. I said, well, have you ever tried not drumming up just to see what happened? And the old man said, are you crazy? Are you insane? You really want to risk something like that? That nobody drumming up the sun for one day? Imagine what would happen. What if it's like, what if the sun won't come up? You really want to play with that? No, we're going to drum the sun up. We don't want to find out. So they drum up the sun. Some Algonquin, crazy Algonquin fool is out there every morning, freezing his butt or her, whatever, to drum up the sun every morning. The birds do it too, by the way. We kill off all the birds. We stop doing ceremony. We don't know what will happen. According to um, the seven fires prophecies, is that and it had seven long periods of time, and the prophets came hundreds of years ago and told us all these things that might happen and all the decisions we have to make, coming up to the end of the period, which, according to my calculations, is about 2000, 2001, that would be the tail year, and that at that point, you know, there'd be a reassessment as to whether we go into the eighth fire, and the prophecy says that if we do four things. And, well, I'm 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 actually taking all the pages and I'm boiling them down into 25 words or less. Okay. Metaphorically, the Vedas. Okay, this is like vast amounts of prophecy into 25 words. That if we do these four things, we will enter into the eighth fire and light it, which is a period of another thousand years of peace and happiness. And that uh, these four things are in the north would be to preserve our ceremonies and our languages of all indigenous cultures to going to the, the south to be um, to practice nonviolence, to be nonviolent every day, using the techniques of resolving conflicts in the natural way. And then the third part would be to the west that would be the rainbow teachings of total racial tolerance, so that all races live can live together in peace and harmony. And I think New York City has done pretty well overall, but you know, lately it's a little tense. The north, the direction of uh, the earth, and that's the direction of environmental activism to be vigilant as landkeepers are in our own lives while we're alive. 
guarding the earth, and also the teachings of the earth changes that will come if people are not vigilant. So the question is, have really have we done these things? And no, we really haven't, according to most of the elders who teach the seven fires. The vast majority of people have slipped on one or more of these things. And what I understood today and from a teaching I received recently was that you know, if we don't like the eighth fire, the eighth fire will come anyway without us. And that's what the prophecy means. Is that the purification in order to have this era of peace, you know, there's animals that will be living in peace. And that they've been saying that in all this hidden language in today, and just say, oh, well, that's what that means. And we'll have the eighth fire, but it just might not be human. Okay, so let's get back to enlightenment because one of the reasons I'm talking about this today here is New York is a very important, Manhattan is a very important part of the prophecy of the River Carolina. And enlightenment is one of the states of consciousness whereby one can be in touch with both the bodhisattvas and the land keepers, and thereby, if there are some of these earth changes, that you will be told where to go and what to do by the land keepers who can tell the future, apparently. That's a teaching. Okay, I'm not saying I can prove that to you, but you can prove it to yourself if you wish that these beings are somewhat knowledgeable. They have somewhat grasp of uh, future events, just as horses do when they know earthquakes are coming, tidal waves, and they have an innate sense. And so they can share, you know, stand over there, stand over there, leave now, you know, this kind of thing. People tell stories all the time, thousands of stories. And uh, so the Bodhisattvas, I think, is exactly the same in that many Buddhists feel they, uh, the Bodhisattvas answer their petitions or just somehow send that little message. So uh, in terms of the Aztec teachings, we're approaching the end of this year, and next we're approaching the beginning of the sixth sun, which means the end of the fifth sun, and that there's purification involved in this, and that ties in exactly with our teachings about the seven sun period. So we're coming up to it. So if there's going to be a great purification, then yeah, I think it would be really important to be enlightened so that you are feeling that uh, in, a, in a blessed state where, you know, if the Creator is going to help somebody, you might, hey, let's help this guy. That you would also be in contact with landkeepers and bodhisattvas too. So you're working with somebody watching you. Chichang Kui Um and also, perhaps, just you know, not have, uh, finding any way to avoid the, the way it would be as well, the, the fear and the confusion. So I'm just saying, this is what I feel like part of why I'm here today. Well, and you say New York is important to the prophecy right now? Well, I wrote a book about that. It's a long story, but it's a 784-year cycle of prophecy based on lunar and solar calendars that coincide every 784 years. So the whole calendar goes, it's all based on turtle, using turtles as calendars, and they're very accurate. And so it's a 784 year cycle to make it simple. And they prophesied all the things that would happen until the end of the cycle, and said, and after that, wipe the eighth fire if you can by doing all these things, and then if you can't, then hey, it might be all over. You know, and it's the teachers have said it. And so, and it doesn't, it's not the same as, you know, the, the Yuga's real. Um, so, here's the thing, is that the New York, is New York right fits in because yeah. Henry Hudson arrived at the exact moment, according to prophecy, that someone would come from across the water to initiate a new phase. It's right in the middle of the 784 years period, and that's the whole, whole book about that. And, uh, and he changed everything, and the question the prophets Mm -hmm. It's not like Revelations where this is the way it's going to be and just get used to it. It's interactive. So the prophecies will say, well, it could be good, it could be bad, it could be bad. It might turn out, if you're not careful, it could be bad or it could be good. And these visitors will bring gifts and teaching. Well, Henry Hudson brought gifts and he brought apparently some teaching like rum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and was it good or bad? Well, it's interesting because Henry Hudson was a pretty good guy overall. I studied his life backwards forwards. 
Robert Jewett was his first mate, and he was just a, a menace. He was a terrible, uh, like very badly adjusted, as we say, person. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly seemed to be paranoid with uh, probably all kinds. I mean, I don't. You know, it's hard to judge the veil of time, but but certainly uh, had a lot of psychosis, a lot of paranoia, a lot of vi very violent men. And the question is, why did Henry Hudson put up it? Well, I think that Henry Hudson was afraid of his own men, and he thought that Jewett would protect him. And in fact, Jewett, time and again, would organize mutinies against poor Henry Hudson. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they left and stranded him in Hudson Bay, which is why they called it that. So the arrival of Henry Hudson in New York City on September 11th of 1609 was exactly in the middle. September 11th? Yes. Okay. At the site of the World Trade Center, by the way, in Hudson Bay. <laughs> and then right exactly in the middle of that cycle, which is exactly where the diamonds are and the bells and everything. It's, it's very strange. So New York City obviously plays some kind of important role, especially down at the bottom of Manhattan. And it's been said all along that this is a place of power for uh, leadership and prophecy. So now I want to talk about Gilugak uh, Gizul, or Elugak Gizul. Elugak Gizul is I am the tool of the creator. Gilugak would be you are the tool of the creator. And this is a very important technique to learn, that everybody should learn. And I think it even enhances Buddhist practice. And this is to be the tool of the creator is to reach a state of, uh, again, that inner seeing, but not using it, but waiting to be used. And I discuss it this way. It's like imagine or visualize that you are a bird sitting on a branch. Now, a bird, when it sits on a branch, is balanced, neither forward nor backwards. Okay. So visualize this for a moment. Sit kind of straight up. And imagine yourself as this bird on a branch, you're balanced. And you make a kind of a vow, similar to the what Buddha said under the bow tree. He said, I will not move from this spot until I attain enlightenment. And so instead of that, you say, I will not move from this spot until spirit tells me what to do. So you're perched on this branch. And you're not going to move until you are directed from whatever level. And you could say it's your higher self, or intuition, or God, or Buddha. But the first thing is to get used to that feeling that you have all the time in the world, and that you are not going to use your own will during this whole exercise. Now, this is an exercise that usually can take several hours. But right now, we just do uh, a little practice run, OK? So you're perched on that branch. And you're not using any personal will. And you have no desire for anything. Why would you? But you're going to wait for an impulse, some idea of what to do, let's say, when you get home. Okay, so just sit on that branch, moving either backwards or forwards. You're in a heightened state of awareness. And this is what I like about baseball, is that shortstops have to learn to do this. Right? I just play some shortstop. And you sit there doing nothing, and yet everything. Because you're waiting for the ball. And you're not going to move until the ball comes to you. So the ball, in this case, is a directive from a higher state of consciousness telling you what to do when you get home. Now, if you get something, you can filter that and say, well, I don't think that I really can do that. That's OK. But sometimes you get wonderful ideas. So let's try this a different way. Let's sit on this branch again. You're still on the branch, neither forward or backward. You're the tool of the creator. And whatever this higher force or intelligence says to you do, you do it, except, of course, with practice, you get to rely on the right messages. Now, I want to ask you to ask the Creator or this higher self to give you a word.
feet in this room. As close as you can. So you're sitting on the branch and you're saying, Creator, 